just it is a nice combination to have. Not many sides have got it, but it's a nice combination to have a, a good left footed kicker. It definitely, definitely allows you to get out of some situations where all right footed kickers can't get out of trouble from. How do you have a hooker that can kick too, like a, a, a hit? It's unreal, yeah. yeah. You've got to kick a hooker that's a really good kicker of the ball. I think, I mean, kicking the ball from dummy half off a good play of the ball is, is a very, very nice play. Yeah. Well, it seems to be a trend in the modern game now with the way players play the game. That uh, and we saw Craig Bellamy last week, you know, talking about switching five different positions. Is that where the game's going? That you, that you need to have multi-skilled players, multi-positional players, being versatile in positions, yep. and be able to play the positions properly. Just not put them there to play the position, but play it well. Yep. Is that what the game's? Because the number on your back doesn't matter much now. No, Greg Inglis I was six and he played on the wing first yeah. up. I mean, it's. What about as far as coaching at junior level? Is it a good thing to be coached in all these different games so that by the time they come to you, <laughs> they can play two or three positions? I think one thing that can happen to kids, and even happen at our level, you get a player at 8 or 9 and people say, he's a left-sided back row, yeah. he's a left-sided centre, and you just put him there. I think we can make mistakes of pigeon on people into spots a bit quickly. Mm. But um, in saying that, people change in positions all the time. doesn't allow them to find a home either. So I think it's just like anything in life, having a balance. But... Having players with the ability to play two and three positions is a bonus. And the other thing that makes it so much more effective these days is the salary cap. You've only got a limited amount of money to spend on so many players. So having having an ability to get your best players on the field and play different positions for you, opposed to having players that aren't quite as good coming and fill those positions, can also help you beat the salary cap a little bit too. Yeah. So you know, most clubs have got players who can comfortably play yeah, not many players. We we just have Benny Hall and Dean Young. We sort of had the two that basically did it for us really well. But this year we'd made a conscious conscious effort ourselves to get more people mouldy skilled. We'd made a put a lot of effort into it. Mm -hmm. Like we were going to have Mark Asney could play five eight fullback or centre for us, uh, which was going to be effective for us. And Benny Hornby can play he can play dummy half and five eight and half back and fullback. So mm -hmm. and we had some forwards who can who can play one forward in particular we bought because he can play centre, so he can help the mix of our side and we've got some front rowers who can play on an edge. So we've worked really hard on that area ourselves this year. And I think most sides have and I think apart from make, making them become better players, as I said, it helps us, helps you with the salary cap as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's another thing for the recruitment guys too when they're looking at players. You're not just looking for a good wide running second row or a wide centre, you're looking for that maybe you can shift and move you, somewhere else. You being a utility player is an art. I mean, when I was a young kid playing at the Drags, we had Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy could play hooker, yeah. lock, 5'8". It's probably centre days would be on you, but he can play hooker like second row five eight for you and play them all and, and do a good job in all of them. And people don't understand how hard that is, you know. Like it's tough enough to play one good one job, do one job solidly, but he could mix into any one of those roles and do a good solid job for the team. Mm -hmm. And he was a very very important player for the club. You know, I think he played in three grand finals. So the club was never given the raps of say a Mark Coyne or a Gordon Tallis or whoever or a Mundine, but. The, what he did for the team, none of those other blokes could, could do, you know, and he was, you know, they are very, very effective players. Mm. The powers to be have given you another another rule. Uh, you're starting the game from your set plays in the 20 metre mark. Um, how do you see it? What's the advantages and do you like it? Well, what you saw the other night was, as uh, Wayne Bennett, Jerry just straight over, the old Foxy Maxie in. I said Maxie's been a good coach for 30 years now, Max, so he's been in the Saints mm. for 15 years now. And, First thing Maxie said was hip back plays are going to cause people problems straight away, and and that's what the Bronx got the Cowboys with twice down. They scored a try straight away, just a, did one play and then hit back down the short side. But what it does is I think it 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 definitely opens up that short side for you. Right, so you know, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't give the defence a chance to really. It adds a little bit more attack. It doesn't give the defence as much of a chance to jam that first play. So it allows you to in some way build some momentum to start off a set piece. You know, there's some coaches who are better off set piece than others. Like Sheen's has always been regarded as a very good set piece man, and you know, yeah. different coaches work well off set pieces, and other coaches are stronger in other areas. But I just think it gives you an opportunity to attack better from a tap, you know, yeah. from, from an earlier play because it helps you build up a bit of momentum because you do have to cover a little bit more of the field. I, I, I like it. Yeah. I know it's Robbie Farry that I took a quick tap, went yeah. straight to the. Yeah. Play left and there's going to be some teething problems with sides defensively. Like, you know, as soon as it comes in, we're all sitting there saying, well, how are we going to defend it? How many people are we going to have it? How are you going to defend it? Yeah. Oh, well, we've come up with a system there which we've tinkered with a little bit just basically it's based on numbers really what, what sort of numbers do you want to leave there you know for, for us and uh you know first of all we started with do you have four or do you have five you know but you know we're sort of looking at the idea of having one of our front rowers defend on right on the tram line and leaving four in there to save the problem that Robbie Farrow and that caused the other night and Canterbury with Corey Hughes nearly got us the, in the trial straight away 
was only had four there, you know. So there was always going to be a little bit of tinkering there, but I think you're going to see some some clever little tap plays as the year mm. develops. Different sides are going to come up with some nice little tap plays, and you may see some some play two tries as you saw from the Broncos the other night, or possibly a play one try. Just see that you can be a bit creative from set plays because a lot of times set plays it's just a tap bang up, but yeah. now you've got something to play with, haven't you? Yeah, well, Andrew Farrow in. When we emerged in 99, Andrew Farrow had this tap that we used to do from play one on the short side, and we actually scored against Melbourne in the semi final from a pretty positive. Mm. And it was a nice little play, you know. So, yeah. you know, those little those plays like that now can become a little bit more, a little bit more of the making, I suppose, because you have a little bit more room to work in. Yeah. Nathan, we just talk just uh, about recovery. Uh, it's become a big part of the game. You've had a hard game this week or in any week. You play today, uh, you travel back home. It's just, and you've got to do it all again next, next week. Now, the most important thing you've got to do is get your team right for next week after yep. today, of course. And the recovery process seems to be everyone's searching for a, a way to get your team right for the week after. What's the process there with recovery? Um, well, again, a lot of sides now are doing ice bars, they're swimming. We do ice bars after lots of sessions, there's massage. But I was saying to someone the other day that the game is definitely harder and faster and people are way bigger now. But you're actually getting some people, in, there's only my opinion, I'm might be going silly, but I think there's actually some people playing now till they're older because the trainers are allowing older people to train smarter, and there's so much time put into recovery that I think that it's helping extend the careers of some people. Like Jason Smith's 35 and still playing, and Smith has lived a pretty reasonably hard life. Smith he hasn't been a teetotal, you know, and he's still going. And I think you know the way trainers are now, you know, getting accustomed to age and people with bad knees. We had Sean Timmons who barely ran for two years. Timmo for three or four years, probably four or five years. So I think trainers are getting smarter in that way. Sorry to be off the track, but no, they're, no, getting no, smarter. Right, no. they're getting smarter in saying, well, you know, Les Davidson and Cronulla, for example, and Danny Lee, like they were great for Cronulla and Johnny Lang's reign there when they went close four or five times to make the grand finals. And I'm, I'm pretty reliably informed that Paul Watson didn't have Les Davidson and Danny Lee doing what all the young whippersnappers were doing. Terry Lamb was a Yeah, Terry Lamb, yeah. Swing. So I just think people got smarter in that area. And on the back of that, with recovery, people are putting so much emphasis into recovery now. You know, through, like we do ice bars after most training sessions now. When I played, I wouldn't know what an ice bath was. But the players <laughs> say they feel great. A lot of time in the massage. So there's, you know, there's, those things have definitely been a huge advancement in the game in the past five years. That's the physical side of recovery. What about the mental side, getting back up? I'm talking now... It's early days, everyone's yeah. fresh, but into the grind of the year, when you've had some really tough games, some yeah. tough road trips, you've got to be mentally that you've got to get them fresh up a bit. One of the keys, two keys to coaching, I think, for anyone is, is picking when you guys do need a break from footy. And, you know, some, I believe, you know, something that Wayne Bennett's been good at, Gordon tell us something, Wayne Bennett was very good at recognising when their players were down a bit, and he'd say, I'm just come and I'll see you on Friday. Um, Laurie Daly was telling me Tim Sheen's at Canberra and they won one of the grand finals in the late 80s or early 90s, whichever it was. They had a fair few blokes who were injured and they'd fallen into the grand final or whatever. I can't remember how the story exactly goes. But there was grand final week. Sheen's got to turn up Monday for the media and then not come back till Thursday, grand final week. And I think they won that grand final. Now where I think So I just think mentally freshening them up is getting the right balance of saying go and have three or four days off. And the key to that is too is when they do go and have three or four days off is that they don't go and do their own training. They don't go and flog themselves. You try and get that point across. You need the, yeah. you need yeah. this rest to get yourself yeah. mentally ready just to mentally freshen yourself up. And I think I'm pre I'd be silly to think that most coaches aren't good at that. Yeah, that's not that's something that I've tried to get better at. And I rely on the staff around me and Paul McGregor, you know, to 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 really inform me if they think some bloke or whether it be one player, whether it be the team, maybe just two or three players might need a break. You know. Yeah. I rely on them a little bit in that area to help me out, yeah. help me out a lot. But it's something that, with the experience, that you, you definitely do get to see the, the physical nature or the colour of people, how they actually are, and they do actually need a break. And I just know we're training. Paul McGregor is sort of like my clock police, you know. He makes sure that we keep training. My first, when I first started training, you'd think the longer you train, the better you get, but it's, that wears them down too, you know. So, you know, I sort of rely on a few of the staff around to help out with that area. Yeah. I suppose you've got that luxury now too in the modern day coaching. You've got this support staff around as a that are monitoring all this stuff too. Any any successful team these days, would, whether you went, if you went to the sides that finished first, second, third and fourth last night, I'd be very surprised if they didn't say that their whole staff had a huge impact. Huh? You have a head coach who obviously you know, gets the, the plaudits if you're winning or gets the signs on the head or the bag and when you're losing and gets abused or whatever. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, 
the times when you're going good, you've got a good coaching staff behind you, and if you are going bad, it's the good people behind you that help you get out of it, and it's strength and conditioning, it's your strappers, your runners.